to introduce to you uh, Travis Metcalf. He's a director of YWAP Research Corporation um, he, in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, he will talk to us about um, crowdfunding astronomy with Google Sky. Here's Travis. Thanks so much. Um, thanks for the invitation. Uh, our organization has been a uh, recipient of uh, the Google Grants program for since 2005. And uh, what I'd like to tell you about today is um, how we've used that to launch one of the longest crowdfunding campaigns in history. <clears throat> um, in, on Valentine's Day in 1990, um, the Voyager spacecraft uh, out beyond the orbit of Neptune turned back and looked towards the inner solar system and took this portrait of the Earth uh, from the edge of the solar system. Uh, and Carl Sagan, the astronomer, uh, challenged us at the time to consider this pale blue dot. He said, that's here. That's home. That's us. Uh, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was lived out their lives uh, on this speck of dust suspended in a sunbeam. Um, of course, in the 25 years since, since this image was taken, uh, we've started to find pale blue dots around other suns. Uh, and particularly, there's been a revolution in the last five years since uh, NASA's Kepler Space Telescope. So I'd like to give you a little bit of background on the Kepler mission, uh, tell you about our crowdfunding program, the history and motivation, uh, and then end with a, with a look to the future. So the Kepler mission was launched uh, at night from Cape Canaveral in uh, March 2009. Uh, this image was taken about a minute after launch. And um, you can see the trail there. And the red points are the solid rocket boosters had just been ejected at that point. Um, the telescope is about the size of a, a small car. The mirror is not particularly big as space telescopes go. It's half the size of the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, and it was launched into an Earth trailing orbit around the sun. So it just follows the Earth around the sun, rather than orbiting around the Earth like other space telescopes do. By NASA standards, this is not a, a big, uh, this is a, a quite a big mission, uh, a discovery class mission um, capped at $600 million for the hardware and launch, and an operating budget of $20 million a year for the first four years. Kepler's job was to look at this one 100 square degree patch of sky in the Milky Way galaxy, in the summer, summer Milky Way. Uh, here it's shown uh, near the constellation Cygnus, also known as the, the Northern Cross. Basically, what Kepler did was monitor the brightness of 150,000 uh, choke. Uh, specifically selected stars in this field and just monitored their brightness over time. Very, very precise measurements of the brightness. Because it's in an Earth trailing orbit, um, it's too far away to download all these huge images all the time because it's taking measurements for those 150,000 stars every 30 minutes. So instead, it just sends down little postage stamp images around each of those 150,000 pre-selected targets. And for a small subset of the targets, 512 at any one time, uh, it would send more frequent measurements. The brightness measurements were done every minute. So you could do additional science that I'll tell, tell you about in a, in a few minutes. So the basic technique that Kepler was using to try and find planets around these 150,000 stars is known as the transit method. Now, some of the 150,000 stars will have planets. Some of those planets will be oriented in just the right way that, from our perspective, the planet will cross the face of the star. And these typically take some number of hours, these transits. Um, so for a certain number of hours, you'll see the star just get a little bit fainter. Um, and then if it's an Earth-like planet in an Earth-like orbit, it might be a year later, you'll see the same event for a few hours and then again a year later. 
So you have to have very precise measurements of brightness to be able to see such a small dip from an Earth-sized planet, but also um, very consistent over time, over a long period of time, three, four years, in order to measure the orbital period of the planet um, and get out to those range of distances where uh, planets have liquid water, for example. Now, the fundamental weakness of this, mesh, of this method, the transit method, is that it only tells you the size of the, of the planet relative to the size of the star. So you only know the properties of the planet as well as you know the properties of the star. Despite that limitation, um, you can lump the uh, planets into large uh, groups with uncertainties on their, on their sizes of a factor of two or so. But you still get a good, um, even though individual planets you don't characterize very precisely, you get a good um, characterization of the distribution of planet sizes from this sort of census that Kepler conducted. And this is the, the fundamental result from the Kepler mission over those um, from 2009 to 2013. Before Kepler launched, um, from ground-based observations, we knew that um, big planets like Jupiter were around maybe 1% of the stars in the sky. And what we discovered from Kepler in the last five years was that Earth-sized planets, smaller planets, are the rule, not the exception. They're very, very common. Um, so in considering planets smaller than about four times the size of the Earth, most stars in the sky have at least one. That's a pretty dramatic transformation in our view of uh, how common planets are. So um, what I, the focus of my team is basically to try and characterize the host star of these planets uh, so that we can pin down their precise sizes and ages and other properties. And we use a little trick for stars like the sun uh, to do that, that's called stellar seismology. Now, every star like the sun has an outer uh, layer that sort of boils from convection. And these boiling motions uh, create sound waves uh, well below the range of human hearing uh, that propagate down into the star and set up standing waves that you can view as brightness variations on the surface, exactly the kind of measurements that Kepler's already making. And that's the motivation for Kepler to be sampling at the one minute cadence, because these uh, variations in brightness uh, due to the seismology signal uh, operate on time scales of just a few minutes in sun-like stars. So this is a close-up picture of an area of the sun with a sunspot, the Earth superimposed there for scale. And you can see these tiny little granules, bubbles of hot gas rising. Each of those granules is the size of the state of Texas. Um, but those bubbles rise and the uh, uh, material over, overflows and, and propagates back down into the star and creates these sound waves. So these sort of measurements uh, of the brightness variations caused by uh, the stellar seismology signal tell us very, very straightforwardly the absolute size of the star and also its age. Uh, and you can use that absolute size to convert the relative size of the planets that Kepler measures from the transit signal into the absolute size of the, of the planet with a precision of only a few percent, a very high precision uh, measurement compared to, say, a 50% uncertainty that you'd get for a typical star that didn't have seismology. So let me give you two examples of planetary systems discovered by Kepler where the seismology team played a significant role in, uh, in the result. The first is the discovery of Kepler-37 a couple of years ago, which is, in fact, still the smallest exoplanet uh, discovered by the Kepler mission. Uh, it's part of a three-planet system. Uh, the largest of those planets is about twice the size of the Earth, here over on the right. Uh, the middle-sized planet is between the size of the Earth and Mars. And the smallest planet is smaller than the planet Mercury in our own solar system, almost as small as the Earth's moon which is just amazing that we can pull out a signal that small. The second example is um, more recent, uh, just earlier this year, Kepler-444. It's an ancient planetary system of, uh, in fact, five planets that are all smaller than the Earth. 
uh, tightly packed into orbits that would comfortably fit inside the orbit of Mercury in our own solar system. Um, the thing that makes this planetary system exceptional is that we were able to measure the age of the star as well. And we found that the star is 11.2 billion years old. Now, for context, the Earth's, the solar system is four and a half billion years old. So it's more than twice as old as our solar system. And the universe itself is 13.6 billion years old. And so this system at 11.2 billion years is almost as old as the universe itself. Uh, it suggests that only in the first uh, two billion years or so of the universe, you already had the conditions that were necessary to begin forming rocky planets like the Earth. Um, and this has a huge impact on um, the likelihood of intelligent civilizations to develop. Because you need, as far as we know, uh, a rocky surface, possibly with an ocean, not on these planets, but in planets that were like them elsewhere in the galaxy that formed further away from their host star. But the fundamental result here is that we were able to measure the age of the star uh, and suggesting that planets have been forming since nearly the beginning of the galaxy in the universe. Now, Kepler has been a spectacular success by any measure. Um, but people forget that it almost got canceled. Um, this is an article from space.com two years before the Kepler mission launched. And the situation at the time was that the Kepler team was behind schedule and over budget by about uh, $40 million. And so they went back to NASA and they said, we're just going to need a little bit more money to finish the project. And it might be a little bit late. And at the time, Alan Stern was a administrator at NASA. You might recognize his name because he's the principal investigator of the New Horizons mission that just went by Pluto. But at the time, he was uh, an administrator at NASA. And he said, no, we're, we're not going to run missions with an open checkbook anymore. Uh, figure out a way to get it done and come back when you're ready. I came back about a month later and said, well, actually, we need $50 million. Um, and he told them, you have one month. Come back to me with numbers like these again, and that will be the end of the project. Uh, and so a month later, they came back and said, oh, yeah, we can do that. We can make it in, uh, 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 in, the, in the original budget. And the way they accomplished that, they had to do two, two adjustments to the baseline mission. Uh, one was originally they wanted a four-year operating mission. And they scaled that back to three and a half, so they just cut off some operating costs off the tail end. But the other big thing that they did was they outsourced uh, all of the stellar seismology work to a European team uh, so that it would be done at no cost to NASA. So this put US participants of that European-led collaboration in a kind of awkward position um, because we were in this bizarre situation where um, Kepler was collecting these beautiful measurements, but there was no support for US scientists to analyze them. So that's what motivated us to start this crowd, uh, crowdfunding campaign to fund the work of the US Consortium of Scientists within that European-led collaboration. And the concept that we came up with was basically an adopt-a-star program uh, for the Kepler targets, those 150,000 stars. Um, Private companies have been uh, offering uh, sort of deceptive name a star uh, programs for decades. Uh, and what we wanted to do was compete against them and undercut their prices. Um, and there were three key features to how we wanted to run the program in what we thought was an ethical way. First, we wanted to be honest about what, what we were actually providing. So we, we labeled it an adopt a star program rather than a name a star or buy a star. So you can think of it like it's analogous to the adopt a highway system. It's understood that the person who adopts a stretch of highway uh, does not own the highway or get to restripe it or anything. Uh, but we post their name on the side of the road to acknowledge their contribution to keep that section of road clean. Right. Um, the second thing is that the program is a nonprofit. 100% of the proceeds from the program would support scientific research on that same set of stars uh, that are in the program. And finally, um, 
we wanted there to be a direct connection between the fundraising mechanism and the science that it supported. So we limited the adopt a star program just to those 150,000 stars that Kepler was actually monitoring um, to search for planets. Oh, I should mention, um, initially, we just um, offered every target star for a $10 donation. Um, but later, after a few years, many of the stars uh, were value added. We discovered that they were double stars, and so we started offering those for $15. Or there was a suspected planetary system around the, the star, but that hadn't been confirmed from follow-up observations from the ground. We offered those for 25 And then if you wanted a confirmed planetary system, uh, it would cost you a $100 donation. So after a, a donor um, submits a donation by PayPal, or in the early days we were also using Google Wallet and Google Checkout, uh, they get a certificate of adoption by email. Uh, they can specify at the time of the donation a name or dedication that they'd like to appear on that certificate. And by default, they're given the brightest um, target or brightest star of whatever category they choose. Uh, but they can choose a specific star if they wanted to choose a number that signified a special date or something like that. They could also do that. And we, in addition to sending out the certificate of adoption by email, we update our website um, every five minutes or something uh, to put that name or dedication in the database with that star so that each star can only be adopted once. Some of these name of star companies will uh, offer the same star over and over to different people, and we thought that was unethical as well. So when we're done with 150,000 stars, that's it. We're out. Now, the uh, centerpiece of our crowdfunding campaign was a representation of the Kepler target list in Google Sky. Um, now, there are 150,000 targets. And so the first thing we tried to do was just put them all in a KML file and view it through the Google Sky browser. And of course, it crashed immediately. But um, fortunately, Google developed uh, this regenerator software with a different application in mind. It came with a, with, a, um, with a sample application to display the Swiss National Rail Network. Um, same sort of problem. You have big train station with lots of uh, connections to other train stations. And when you're looking from far, you should only see those busiest train stations. But as you zoom in closer and closer, you'd see the smaller and smaller towns with fewer connections. So all we did was replace the train stations with stars and prioritize by brightness instead of the number of connections. Now the green stars in this rep representation are available for adoption, and the red stars, we mark, change it to red when, once they're adopted so people know they're already taken. And uh, stars with confirmed planetary systems get a special pale blue icon in Google Sky. Now, although it was a fantastic outreach tool, uh, Google Sky proved to be a frustrating technical obstacle for many of our users. You had to have the um, Google Earth plugin in your browser, and that was only available for, for Mac and Windows, and not for Linux, and not for mobile devices. Um, and so for many people, they just couldn't get it to work. Uh, and even those who did had, had some difficulty browsing. So, a Dutch software engineer um, who experienced this problem decided to try to make it easier for other people to adopt a star um, another way. And so he imported the Kepler target list into a database um, and made a simple interface to query it by the adoption name or the star number and to sort it by different properties. Uh, and he made the code available to us and helped us integrate it into our system. So um, one of the consequences of this approach is that each star then had its own web page uh, in the database. And so he included there an image of the star in Google Maps, which was a little bit more friendly for a broader range of users. And then we included basic information about the star, 
simple properties, coordinates in the sky, and a link to download the certificate. Uh, so this became a person's individual star page once they made an adoption. Um, this is an example of one of those individual star pages of the, the most shared page in our database on social media. Uh, oh Sehun is a member of the Korean pop band EXO. Uh, and so a, a loyal fan adopted this star uh, for that, for him. Uh, so by default, you see the image of the star in Google Maps, but uh, you see we can switch into the sky view as well if you have the browser plugin installed. And then we also added this feature that if you click and just want a list of stars that are close to the star that you adopted, then it shows you where your star is and the several nearby stars, making it easy for family and friends to adopt a star next year, trying to make it social. So this is a history from the first seven years of running our, our um, star adoption service. Uh, so the weekly visits, a uh, visit is defined as a, um, a session with at least one interaction, um, up to 30 minutes. And um, sessions that did not involve interactions typically exceed these by a factor of four or so. So we're getting a lot of traffic that doesn't end up, that just bounces. Uh, and on the bottom, uh, the corresponding number of star adoptions during that same period. Now there are, there are periodic spikes and there are episodic events in this time series. Uh, the, the periodic spikes come during the popular gift giving holidays. So Christmas and Valentine's Day primarily uh, where traffic goes up. Uh, and the episodic spikes are uh, when either social media or traditional media coverage of our program uh, traditional media, typically when our team was involved in the scientific discovery and we could um, issue press releases or talk with the press about the story and how we supported it. Uh, social media, more typically by enthusiastic uh, donors who wanted to share the program with others. Now you say there's a, a fairly strong but nonlinear correlation between visits and donors. Um, and initially, we just focused on driving as much traffic as possible, primarily through the Google Grants program, uh, to try to increase the number of star adoptions just by driving more traffic to the site. But in the last few years, we've focused more on trying to uh, turn more of those visitors into donors. Now, the three biggest spikes in star adoptions, I mean, every spike has an interesting story behind it. But let me just briefly mention the three biggest ones. This earliest spike uh, in 2008 uh, corresponded to a, a very short post on the uh, tech news website Slashdot, um, where uh, this was actually before the Kepler target list had been released. And so we were just offering star adoptions uh, to early adopters who could then select a star um, later once the target, re target list had been uh, released. So there were no technical obstacles at all during that early time. And nearly one in three uh, visitors during that spike uh, ended up adopting a star. The second spike corresponded to a uh, traditional press release that we um, sent out to the media in, in 2009. Uh, and it was picked up by space.com and a couple days later by New Scientist. Uh, and the, it had a, um, actually a, a bigger impact overall because it was sustained over a longer period of time. But the most interesting spike happened uh, just last year, last summer, when Ukrainian astronomers uh, adopted a star for a, a not so nice nickname for uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin. Um, now, as intended, our, our star adoptions were indeed uh, undercutting the prices of competitors. And this led to a situation where um, third party resellers began setting up in other countries, uh, marketing the service in a foreign language, um, and then uh, adopting the star through our website, but then acting as a middleman, and then um, giving value added services, uh, star charts and images, that sort of thing. So this uh, star adoption came through one of those third party resellers in the Ukraine. We've also had 
uh, third party resellers in China and Russia and Italy. Um, after the Ukrainian astronomers um, adopted the star in late June of 2014, they uh, posted the image of the, the third party reseller's star adoption certificate on, on Facebook and uh, it went viral on social media. Uh, I could see that something was going on just by the traffic to the website and the frequency uptick in uh, Ukrainian star adoptions. Uh, but I really became aware of the situation when I got a call on July 4th. The morning of July 4th, I got a call from uh, the Moscow Times asking me for comment on the situation. Uh, and uh, they asked if, if once, now that we knew what this um, Ukrainian slur actually meant, uh, would we allow the name to stand? And I told them, free speech is now written in the stars. Uh, we have no plans to censor any of these star adoptions. Uh, we appreciate the support for science. So. Uh, there were some Russians who were not very pleased about that decision, uh, but so far nothing's come of it. Now, when we started this program, uh, we imagined 150,000 targets, $10 per target. We would quickly raise the $1.5 million and have an endowment for our research through the life of the Kepler mission. And, and in, in another universe, that might have actually worked out that way. Um, in one of our early adopters from the slash dot post in 2008, happened to know a writer for the Colbert Report uh, and pitched an idea to the show uh, to do a, a segment about our program. Um, but unfortunately, uh, they never did it. I think they had a hard time figuring out how to make it funny. So um, There was another instance where we were contacted by a British marketing firm who was getting ready, this was about five years ago, getting ready to um, celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Super Mario Brothers um, video game. And they wanted to adopt a, a set of stars in, the sh in a constellation shaped like Mario's head. <laughs> that never came to fruition either. The client didn't go for it. Um, but if either of those things had happened, it might have given our um, program enough exposure to, to build that endowment early on and, um, and support our research through the whole mission. Uh, nevertheless, it was, a, it was a moderate success. Over the first seven years, we raised more than $100,000 through the program. Now, just to put that in perspective, uh, a typical NASA grant to an individual principal investigator is more than that in a single year. So uh, we were just stretching uh, a little bit of money over a lot of years. But even so, we were able to um, sponsor, co-sponsor five science conferences of our collaboration, including support for students and early career researchers to, to attend those meetings. Dozens of um, students and early career researchers for each meeting were, were supported by that. Uh, we also sponsored public lectures. We paid publication charges for our collaborators in third, third world nations. Um, so even though it wasn't uh, the $1.5 million endowment that we had hoped for. Um, it did provide some useful support for our team. So let me talk a little bit about the future. The successor to the Kepler mission um, has al already been approved for a launch in August of 2017. It's called the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS. And what TESS will do is basically TESS will do for the whole sky what Kepler did for this one small patch of the summer Milky Way, uh, but for brighter stars. So it will try to find, uh, now that we know that Earth-sized planets are everywhere, very common, um, it will try to find the nearest examples around the brightest stars in the sky where we can actually have a hope of characterizing those planets extremely well, maybe even detecting their atmospheres. This is a full-scale model of the TESS satellite uh, with the core science team at MIT. Uh, TESS is quite a bit smaller mission than the Kepler mission was. Uh, it's an explorer-class mission, which is capped at a $200 million budget for hardware and launch. Um, there are funds in the TESS mission to 
to build this spacecraft and the instruments, to, to launch it and to operate it for a two-year mission. Um, and for limited um, follow-up observations from, from the ground to try to weed out some of the um, signals that could look like a transiting planet but aren't actually there due to something else. So the end of the, at the end of the test mission, they will have um, a list of planetary systems around the brightest stars in the sky, identified and vetted to some extent. Um, but there's no funding in the mission to do science on those targets. It's a kind of ironic. Um, they'll just release the data into a database. And um, they have a similar arrangement with this European team to do this stellar seismology analysis. I'm not sure how they're going to get the exoplanet analysis, I mean, just the transit analysis uh, itself. This is uh, one of four uh, telescopes, really large cameras, that TESS will use to scan the whole sky. Um, each of these cameras um, will basically capture six times the size of the Kepler field. Um, and there's four of them. So at any one time, it will be looking at, at 24 times the area of the Kepler field. And essentially, what the program is, is to scan the sky in strips. Um, so it will look at the northern ecliptic hemisphere in these strips, 13 strips in, during the first year, that will flip over and do the southern hemisphere in another 13 strips. So just a two-year mission. Um, those, the cameras are arranged so that they stack vertically like this. Uh, and the, the one that's at the pole more or less stays the same um, during each of those years. So even though each of these strips is only monitored for 27 days, that highest latitude, that ecliptic pole field, uh, is, is monitored for a full year, continuous. So uh, right, the issue with that is that most, much of the sky, you'll only have 27-day time series. And so you'll only get the planets that are relatively close in and go around frequently. But at the, at the pole, you'll discover many planets in longer orbits. Uh, we expect TESS to discover thousands of new planets, including dozens of, of planets that are the size, similar in size to the Earth and in the habitable zone of, of its star where liquid water could potentially exist. Uh, and again, um, there will be a specified list of targets, 200,000 in the case of TESS. All of those targets will be monitored at that faster cadence of, of one or two minutes that will allow you to do stellar seismology. Um, but the orbit of TESS actually allows for these full images to be downloaded. And so there will be a 30-minute cadence for the entire sky um, where you'll actually get all of those images. And so you know, some tens of millions of stars that you don't have to pre-select can be scanned for planets um, from, that, from those full images. So um, as I mentioned, the arrangement with this European team is the same, and they'll just release the data after each strip, in fact, uh, into the archive at the Space Telescope Science Institute um, and uh, let people go with it. And, and it puts us in this bizarre situation where um, NASA is essentially launching a, a mission that, um, that primarily European scientists whose countries are wisely investing in science uh, will be allowed to exploit. Um, with no support for the, for the US um, science. Or, or no support, little support beyond the traditional programs that NASA already does. Nothing specific to this mission. So that's what motivates us to launch a new crowdfunding campaign, um, specifically for the test mission, uh, based more or less along the lines of what the one that we've done so far, but trying to um, really get the US community together and behind this effort. Um, so that um, we can maybe get that endowment up front and get the science going from the beginning. So we have a consortium of a dozen 
universities, research labs, and observatories, uh, coordinating closely with the science team leaders at MIT and Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Um, and basically what we want to do through this TESS astrophysics group is to characterize the host stars of the planetary systems that TESS identifies during its two-year mission. So we have started um, a project on the Benevity website. You may know that um, Google has an employee gift matching program uh, through the Benevity, Benevity website. And uh, just uh, with the 200,000 targets, we expect the lifetime of the, over the lifetime of the mission to try to raise $2, $2 million, $10 per star again um, for the test mission to support our research. And that is um, typical of what a large research group could expect to get from NASA if they had any money to give uh, for a, a two-year mission. If that doesn't suit your fancy, there, there are um, some volunteer opportunities for trying to scale this Kepler Adopt-A-Star program up to, uh, to the task of, of dealing with tests if we, if we are successful in, in creating uh, a larger wave up front. Uh, one is uh, we need to have integrated payment system into our website. We're currently using a third-party provider. Um, and it's difficult for our analytics because people disappear off our website and we don't know why or uh, what happened to them when they don't come back. Um, we need real-time processing of the star adoptions. It's currently run by a kind of a kludge of, sh of shell scripts and cron jobs uh, that if the frequency of star adoptions goes significantly faster, um, that system would break. Um, we could use some help integrating social networking into the website. Um, we're scientists, not social networking or marketing experts. And um, we have limited mobile adaptability to our website, but it's, it, it could also use some improvement. And finally, uh, we anticipate sometime in the next year uh, launching a Kickstarter campaign to try to get a little bit of funding up front to begin hiring students and raising awareness about the program. Um, so if you're interested in helping us launch something like that, um, get in touch. Uh, and with that, I would just like to thank um, the various sponsors who have helped um, support our program over the years. First and foremost, Google for the, for the uh, sponsored advertising through the grants program. Uh, we also get free hosting from, from DreamHost, who does that for all nonprofits, as far as I understand, um, and discounted donation processing from PayPal. Uh, we've worked with a, a local marketing optimization team in Boulder, and a few individuals who helped us uh, refine our, our tools and presentation. So with that, I will thank you. Take questions. You mentioned. Uh, that you're looking for, like in looking for Earth-esque planets, um, that you were looking at some of the largest suns or stars, I guess, in the solar system. So I was just curious um, to have an Earth-esque planet. Does the, does the star have to be a certain size? And where does our sun fall? Like, how would you locate it in the spectrum of like small to large stars? Sure, yeah. Um, well, there is a habitable zone around any star, uh, regardless of its size. But the smaller stars are cooler, and so you just have to be closer for that um, habitable zone to where hit liquid water could exist. The sun's a, a, a pretty average star. It's, it's, um, there are numerous stars that are smaller, but there are also stars that are quite a bit bigger than the sun. So it's, it's pretty average. Um, now, TESS, for example, will find, because much of the sky will be um, scanned in 27 days, that they expect to find many of those um, habitable planets around smaller stars, where the uh, orbits will be closer in. And um, that's just fine, because it actually turns out um, that Smaller planets are more common around smaller stars as well. And um, if you, the smaller stars are much less bright. And so it, once you find those systems, it makes it easier, actually, to use the techniques that you can use to 
probe the atmospheres of those planets, it's actually easier to subtract off the light of the star and, and be left with light that comes through the atmosphere of the planet. Um, so in, in many ways, um, tests will actually position us um, really well to be able to learn quite a bit more about these planetary systems that are discovered. In particular, because that continuous um, viewing zone at the ecliptic poles, that corresponds to the place where the James Webb Space Telescope, the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, will always be able to look. Uh, and so um, particularly if you find those candidates in those poles uh, with uh, continuous monitoring up to a year, remember, um, those systems will be accessible to the James Webb Space Telescope. Do you expect the star to go away, to die? Um, which star? I mean, the, those 150 some thousand stars that, that you have. Yeah, all stars will eventually die. I mean, yeah. um, some with a bang and some with a whimper. Okay. But um, only the most massive stars, uh, much um, more massive than the sun, like more than about eight times the <coughs> size of the sun or the mass of the sun, will explode as supernova. Um, so most of the stars that Kepler intentionally targeted, stars that are more like the sun, and uh, those will. Um, sort of blowed up into red giant stars, uh, lose most of their outer envelopes as, uh, as nebulae, um, hot gas in space, and leaving behind uh, the exposed hot white dwarf star. Um, that's the namesake of our organization, in fact, um, the, the remnant um, in the middle. Um, so in the sun, in the case of the sun, this will happen about five or six billion years from now. So it's a, it's a middle-aged star. Um, more massive stars, um, you know, twice the mass of the sun, go through that process much more quickly, so their lifetimes are quite a bit shorter. The lowest mass stars, the ones where TESS uh, will find these closely packed planets that are still habitable, um, those very cool stars, they are um, they're much less, um, their lifetimes are, are very long, longer than the age of the universe. Uh, and so in some ways, that makes them a really nice place to try to start life, because they have a lot of time to, to take root. Um, so a lot of factors determine um, these issues of habitability. Um, on the other side, um, you've got um, the fact that those stars actually tend to be a bit more active. Um, they eject material and harmful radiation into the regions around them, and those habitable zones are closer. And so it actually might be harmful. And so one of the things we're hoping to do, uh, in addition to just characterizing those planetary systems in terms of their sizes and ages, is to do ground-based observations that will establish um, how habitable those planets are really beyond just the ability of liquid water. To so for your 20% project, uh, can people work remotely or need to be in Boulder to work with you? Yeah. Oh, absolutely, people yeah. can work remotely. Um, uh, it's essentially a virtual institute already because our our team is scattered across the country. So, uh, so it essentially demands that we all work remotely. Thank you, everyone, for Thanks. coming. Mm -hmm.